Baruchot Abaot, ladies, and welcome to another edition of our Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to our incredible Torah site for women, ohelsara.com, or to Torah anytime, or if you are a YouTube subscriber, thank you so much for tuning in every single time we post a lecture. For your de- dedication and devotion to your neshama, HaKadosh Baal, who should continue to fortify your spirituality so that you can merit only to good things. I want to take the time to thank all of you, every single sponsor, donor, who has been Baruch Hashem logging onto ohelsara.com and sponsoring so, so, so many incredible chasadim, incredible kind deeds. Whether you're sponsoring for our local mikvah or for Kimcha de Pischa, for our Pesach campaign to help needy families, divorcees, and widows be fed for the Chag. Whether you're logging on and sponsoring a lecture or Torah hours, we thank you so, so very much. And you should be blessed. The Shabbat should bless you with all the good in the world, with tremendous health and happiness and a special protection. Thank you so, so very much. We truly appreciate it. Please say amen to the following, for a refuah shlema, for the speedy recovery of Benjamin Meir Ben Aviva Masha. He just came out of back surgery. We wish him a refuah shlema. For the refuah shlema, the speedy recovery of Dalia Batalis, the 65-year-old woman who's in progressing stages of cancer, Zakadosh ba- cancer. Kadosh Baruch Hu should give her a speedy recovery. We should hear that she's in remission and that she's doing well. For the Refuah Shlema of Yaakov Ben Naami, for the Refuah Shlema of Yohanna Wankmiller, and for the Refuah Shlema of Avraham Yehuda Ben Liba Leia. Also, for the Ilui Neshama, for the elevation of the soul of Rabnoya Melimelech, the Kadosh Vetahor, the great rabbi, Rabnoam Elimelech, Halava Shalom, Shuto Yagen Alenu. For the Ilui Neshama of Chaya Mindel Bat Mordechai Alea Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of Mirol Bat Tzvi Alevi Alea Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of Ratza Bat Menachem Akain Alea Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama of Tzvi Ben Chona Reuven Alevi Alava Shalom. Le Ilui Nishmat Lea Bat Moshe Alea Shalom. The Ilui Nishmat Alyssa Hertzan's mother, Susan Moses, and for the Ilui Neshama of Gabriela Batvi Alea Hashalom. For the health, success, Parnasa, Bracha, and closeness to Hashem, Janin Batchava, Sarah Miriam Batchava, and Tzvi Ben Basha. We also have a special dedication that Johanna Wankmuller sent us when she. Um, sponsored. What a beautiful message. She's dedicating her the memo read for all the shirim that the Rabbanit has taught me and others that has changed me for the good. I dedicate these hours. She sponsored Torah hours uh, for those who are uh, being reached through these lectures who will also experience the change and love of Hashem as I have. What a beautiful message. Thank you so much, Yohana. And uh, that brings me to the thank yous for all those who have been sponsoring Torah Hours. Thank you so very much. Makes me so happy when you sponsor Torah Hours. Thank you to Catherine Reefer, to Anita Hug, to Johanna Wankmuller, to Nirma Diaz, 300 Hours of Torah, George Shemezi Bereme, 500 Hours of Torah, Kathy Fujioka, 700 hours of Torah. Thank you so much. And thank you for all those who have been uh, mailing us to our Brooklyn address checks. Thank you so much to the Carrera family, to Tirza Smith, and to Julie Haber. Thank you so much. But most of all, for the beautiful letters that you write that are so inspiring and so moving. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. Of course, we want to wish tremendous hatzlacha, tremendous success and protection for all our chayalim, all our soldiers out there who are still in battle and 
fighting so that we should be able to sleep well at night. And for all those who are abducted by Hamas, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should bring them home. No more wars. He should bring the Geulah to all of Am Yisrael. And, but, but especially now, we need protection for the Chayalim and protection and the safe return of all our hostages from Aza. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should just bless us. So bless us all and protect our precious fellow brothers and sisters. This shiur has been partially sponsored by Alyssa Hertzan in memory of her mother, Susan Moses, alayha shalom. And we dedicate this shiur not only to the ilui neshama of her mother, but also to the protection and safety of all Am Yisrael, no matter where they are in the world, and to every righteous Gentile, every Noahide out there who has been helping and supporting Am Yisrael, all of those who are, Baruch Hashem, slowly disconnecting themselves from idolatry and clinging to Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should protect them as well. We have a lot of work to do today and a discussion that is not easy at all. You know, there are times during the year that we have heart-to-heart discussions, heart-to-heart shiurim. Some of those shiurim are not by any means easy to address, to write, to give them over, because you're always afraid, at least some lecturers are afraid, that the truth that you have to project will not be accepted properly. Not everybody is willing and ready to hear the truth. But Baruch Hashem, I have such amazing followers of YouTube and Torah Anytime and also on the Ohel Sara platform. So many people who are longing for the truth that I know that your neshamot at this stage of the game your neshamot are ready to accept, and more than that, to respond. We are just about a week away from Chag Pesach, the holiday of redemption and miracles. And Be'ezot Hashem, in the coming days, I will also be offering words prior to this magnanimous holiday, some beautiful ideas that you can uh, take with you into the Chag. But today, I want to address the many, many emails and comments that were made on YouTube as well that, uh, that have been sent to me asking me about the waters that seem to be heating up in the political world and that may soon boil over and overflow. Many of you want to know what it means for the future. Are we safe in Eretz Yisrael? Should we consider leaving the Holy Land? We do, by the way, you know my position on that. <laughs> what about the Jews in America? You all, want to, you all want to know, should they remain there or should they come back? Should they come home? Will there be a world war? If yes, how soon? I sense your panic and distress, and it's quite understandable. Judging by the direction the world seems to be heading in, it only appears as though the situation is becoming worse than the day before it, especially now with Iran's threats against Israel and against America, and Israel is on the highest alert. Uh, We've stocked up on food and water, which is what we've been told to do. And we know that an attack is imminent. And all of you are wondering the same thing. What does this mean for Jews and for Gentiles all over the world? What does it mean for us? So as promised, I will be responding to all of your questions through the shiul. And I want to say that I feel very humbled that so many of you reached out to me and that you trust me enough to offer you advice and guidance. And I, I appreciate your faith in me. It's certainly a holy mission to reply to all of your emails, to all of your text messages, to all your comments, but also a great responsibility that has been placed uh, in my lap to tend to each person who contacts me, no matter the question or dilemma that he or she may have. And um, so thank you. Thank you so much for placing your uh, faith in me. 
And I hope that Hashem will bless me with the right words that I can give over to you. And I hope that you will accept the words that are coming out of my heart and the extensive research that I've done on this topic. And I want to say that whatever I'm going to speak about today has many interpretations and opinions according to our Chachamim. And that means that many things can change based on our efforts and holy actions. I will merely be citing just a few sources that I think, in my humble opinion, point to this time period that we're in now of Achrit Yamim of the end of days. And I'm going to do my very best to explain the words of our Nevi'im, of our prophets and our Chachamim and our sages, as well as to offer you clarifications based on even modern day rabbis who have commented on these passages in our Tanakh, in the Gemara, and the Midrashim. So please take this into account as we proceed. Secondly, if you've heard my lectures before, you know that I'm not the kind of person who wants to conceal the truth from you or to mask it in any way. Uh, you know that I will not be uh, cuddling your emotions too much, nor will I be offering you any false hope because I feel that that is a wrong approach. Now, that, that's not about being pessimistic versus being optimistic. No, my role as a spiritual mentor is to prepare you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, even physically to a great degree, for what's to come, and to offer you the opportunity to create merits. You need to know the truth. You need to be given the information so that you can make informed decisions in your life, so that you could decide how to go about your spiritual endeavors. Each of us during this pressing time in the world has to make what I call we must all introspect and decide what to do. So please know that I will only be offering you the truth of what our prophets, sages, and mefarshim and all the commentaries have written and prophesied about. And I pray that you will appreciate the message, that you will internalize it, and that you will proceed forward in your life accordingly. Another thing that's important that you know is that I am by no means, by no means an expert in the world of politics. I am not any authority on government. I am only a spiritual mentor. As I said, I, I can only offer you the words of our sages and prophets and Sadly, although many of us choose to ignore or interpret their words to fit our uh, life narrative, and we do so because the words of our Nevi'im and Chachamim were at oftentimes very strict and very graphic and very frightening when it concerned the topic of Achrit Yamim of the end of days. But in order to be saved from the impending war of Gog and Magog, and what will take place after that, we have to be open to hear and to react in the manner that HaKadosh Baruch Hu would want us to, because everything that's happening in the world right now is of his making. And it's God who's maneuvering the players on the field to his end. And because ultimately God wants his children, Am Yisrael, and all the righteous Gentiles in the world to react in a certain way. So my task is to teach you. Your job is to utilize your Bechira Chofshit, to utilize your free will, and then to respond to the reality. And what's certain is that it is the reality and no one can stop it. There is a moving train that's heading in our direction that has already left the station, my dear friends. Hopefully, We'll all be waiting on the platform to hop on board the train of salvation before it leaves the stations that it's supposed to stop at. 
So let me begin with the words of the Yalkut Shimoni concerning the prophecies that are found in Sefer Yeshaya Hanavi Alav Shalom, specifically in Perek Samech, 60th chapter, and then we'll proceed from there. But the Midrash of the Yalkut Shimoni states as follows. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, alav shalom. Rabbi Yitzchak said, this was actually a prediction that Rabbi Yitzchak made centuries ago, according to the words that he read in Yeshaya Hanavi, specifically the 60th chapter. And he writes, Rabbi Yitzchak writes, Shana shemelech ha-mashiach niglabo, the year that the earthly king Mashiach will be revealed, Kol umot ha'olam mitgarim zebeze. All the nations of the world will be quarreling this one with the other. This is something that we see is currently happening. Uh, Russia is at war with Ukraine. China has its eye on Taiwan, maybe even on America. There's a war taking place in uh, Yemen. Haiti has internal conflict. Hamas waged war against Eretz Israel in general. The entire world is in a very delicate state of conflict that can at any moment erupt into a massive world war. And the question is, what, or rather who, will be the catalyst for this war? Who will be the one who will ignite this final world battle? Continues the Midrash, or Bitzchak continues. Melech Paras, the king of Persia, who we know Paras is Iran, mitgare bemelech Aravia. He will challenge the king of Aravia. Now, we don't know exactly who this is. We can assume it might mean Syria. It might mean Saudi Arabia. We see that happening now as well. What will the king of Aravia do, according to Rabbi Tzchak in the Midrash, the king of Aravia will go to the kingdom of Edom, who we know is America, and he will ask them for guidance and advice as to how to engage with the king of Persia, with Iran. And then what? The Choser Melech Paras, Umachriv et Kol Haolam Kulo. And the king of Persia, meaning Iran, returns, I would assume from negotiations on this conflict, and he destroys the entire world. His intention, the king of Paras, is to create devastation and destruction. This is obviously a reference to a nuclear war that within seconds, minutes at best, can eradicate hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And then Rabbi Yitzchak writes, V'chol umot ha'olam mitra'ashim u'midbahalim v'noflim al p'nehem. And all the nations of the world will tremble and panic and they will fall on their faces. The entire world will be in a great state of distress and of fear. V'ye'echoz otam tzirim ketzirei yoleda. And suddenly the entire world will be gripped with painful contractions like the contractions of a birthing woman. Now, this is to signify how unbearable the pain is going to be. And the people of Israel will quake and they will be frightened and they'll say, where will we go and where will we come? Rabbi Yitzchak is telling us that many Jews won't know where to turn, where to run to, or if it will benefit them to escape or to remain exactly where they are. They'll be stricken with panic, not, not knowing what to do or, or, or where to turn to, whom to turn to. But then, God will speak to them, to the Jewish people through all kinds of signs that he's basically saying through those signs, Banai, my children, al tirau, do not fear. Higia zman geulatchem, the time has come for your redemption. 
ולא כגאולה ראשונה, כך גאולה אחרונה. It will not be as the first redemption in Egypt, this final redemption. Hashem is telling us that the final redemption is not going to be like the geula in Egypt. In what way will the final redemption differ from that of the Egyptian redemption? Says Rabbi Yitzchak, Ki geula rishona, because during the first redemption in Egypt, haya lachem tsa'ar v'she'ibud malchiyot achareha. You experienced tremendous sorrow and then you were subjected to the governance of other kingdoms after you left Egypt. So yeah, you were freed from Egypt, but then you had four other exiles that you had to contend to. That's, that's obviously referring to the, the, uh, uh, the uh, exile of Babel, of Yavan, right? Of Paras Omadai, and the current exile that we're in, that we underwent even after we were redeemed from Egypt. And then Hashem promises us, but the final redemption, you will not have any more sorrow or persecution following it. Why? Because this will already be the complete and final redemption. You hear this? For those living in Eretz Yisrael who are observing the Torah and its mitzvot with love and with happiness in their heart, for those who have made all the sacrifices to be here, to live here with a little less materialism because you know what's important is kedusha, is holiness. To those people I say, don't be afraid. Don't run away to another country because it's in that country that all the troubles will unfold worse than those that will occur in Eretz Yisrael. So although Rabbi Yitzchak is telling us that the period that will lead to the redemption will be very challenging, dreadfully frightening, and we're going to experience tremendous troubles and great difficulties, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu guarantees that all of this is to sift the world of its evil so that it's left with genuine and sincere advocates of Torah and true followers of Hashem and only Hashem. Hashem will create a huge fear and a chaos for us to call out to Him, to, to come close to Him, to feel that there is, can be no other who will redeem us other than him. And we have no one on whom to rely on. Other than Hashem in the heavens. We have to believe that. God is our father. It's now more than ever that we must be steadfast in our emuna, And until this day of judgment surfaces, which I believe is imminent, we have to do our very best to be involved in as much good in as much benevolent and holy acts as possible. We should engage in the learning of and in the promotion of Torah in kind and charitable deeds. That's why we set up so many opportunities for you here at Ohel Sarah that you could just log on and have so many, many chasadim to partake in. But also, anyone who is practicing idolatry should abandon this ideology and embrace only Hashem. That's that piece of advice. But to all of our fellow Jews who are still in America or through in other parts of the world, I beg you to try and make your way to Eretz Israel as soon as you can before the gates of mercy close and then you remain trapped there. Lo alenu. Don't allow history to once more repeat itself with you as its victim. Don't think that we are going to now defy the past and that our present will be different than that of our ancestors. Germany will never be repeated. Don't think like that. Because if we, rep if we replicate the previous errors, if we adapt the same attitude and even the same arrogance of our predecessors, we may be confronted with very difficult challenges that we'll regret. 
Please do what's right for the sake of your family and its future. If you truly believe in the coming of Mashiach, you should begin making your way to Eretz Yisrael. Chachamim teach us that the Galut places a barrier between the heavens and the earth, which makes it harder for us to see the truth of God's wishes. And sadly, although the Galut, the exile, is supposed to prompt us to do tshuva and to mend our ways so that we can be redeemed, it also has the ability, this Galut, to do a great deal of damage. So although many Jews outside of Eretz Yisrael proclaim that they want the Mashiach and that they hope to live in Eretz Yisrael one day, you know, in the future when Mashiach comes or when they retire, whatever that means, I'm glad uh, that they can already foresee their future. According to Al Chachamim, this kind of talk is antithetical to the Geula because it actually demonstrates a lack of genuine yearning for the redemption. Because what these people really mean to say is, well, we're comfortable where we are. If Mashiach comes, we might go, but, but until then, we're good here in the Galut. There are many Chachamim who have written that such an attitude reveals that even if Mashiach came, those people would have a hard time responding to the redemption. They're not going to pick up so fast and leave their beautiful homes wherever they may be and come live in Eretz Yisrael. What's the proof of that? What's the proof? The Chachamim can't just say that and walk away. It's kind of offensive to say that to the Jews living outside of Eretz Yisrael. But they bring proof in something that we see actually transpired in Egypt. The Jewish people in their slavery and the tortures that they were undergoing were crying out to the Ribbono Shel Olam that he should redeem them because of the great suffering that they were experiencing in Mitzrayim. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu finally heard their pleas and he sent the Redeemer, Moshe Rabbeinu alav shalom, with the Mate Elokim, with the holy staff of God in his hand and the magic words on his lips of Pakod Pakaditi. That's the code of redemption. Moshe's job was to redeem Am Yisrael from this horrible galut, to respond to the outcry. Well, you know what happened, don't you? When Moshe Rabbeinu made his appearance in Egypt, and as Hashem was creating all these miracles there for the Jews to behold, the Midrashim tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu had a very difficult time persuading the majority of the Jews to leave that terrible galut. Hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of Jews fought Moshe Rabbeinu tooth and nail. And not only did they refuse to leave Egypt, the same Egypt that tortured them and murdered their children, the same Egypt that they were so anxious to be redeemed from, and they cried to Hashem about it, they refused to leave the horror of that place. Chachamim tell us it's because they didn't genuinely believe in the Geula that they themselves cried out for. They were too seeped in the Galut, in the exile. So what happened? We all know what happened. Sadly, 80% of the Jewish population who didn't genuinely have faith in the Geulah and who fought against it with all kinds of justifications and excuses died in Egypt during Makat Choshech, during the plague of darkness. Only 20% of the Jews were worthy of being redeemed. Only the ones who truly longed for the Geulah, not only in their words, but in their actions remained alive and were zaycha, they merited to partake of the redemption. And Chachamim tell us that we see the same pattern just a few years prior to the story of Purim that took place in Persia and 52 years after the destruction 
of the first Bet HaMikdash when a prophecy, a nevuah, was indeed fulfilled. You see, there was a Persian king named Koresh. He, at that time, conquered Babel. He conquered the Babylonians, and he gave the order that the second Bet HaMikdash she should be rebuilt in Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh. That was, by the way, a prophecy that was foretold by the Navi Yeshaya 200 years before this. When Yeshaya Navi said, Ko Amar Hashem lemeshicho lekoresh. So said God to his anointed one, to Koresh. Notice, by the way, how Yeshayahu already knew the name of the anointed one, which is fascinating. So said God to his anointed one, Koresh. For the sake of my servant Yaakov and Israel, my chosen one, who yivne iri vegaluti yashalach. He, this Gentile Persian king Korah, shall build my city and free my captives. When Korah allowed the Jews to leave the Babylonian galut and to go home and build the Bet Migdash, this was about two years before Achashverosh became the king, and four years before the opening scene of Megillat Esther. That's the historical background. Now, to the Jewish people at that time, who were all too familiar with the prophecies of Yeshaya, Koresh's gesture, gesture to release them from the Galut should have been a sign for them to return to Yerushalayim and to rebuild the second Bet HaMikdash that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, by the king of Babylonia. They should have considered it a rare opportunity that was given to them by Hashem through the righteous Gentile king Koresh. Hachamim tell us that they should have paid attention to the prophecy that was told over by Yeshaya Hanavi, the prophecy that was actually now coming to life. They should have understood that this was the divine will of Hashem, that all Jews should return from the exile and rebuild the Bet HaMikdash in the Holy Land. As a matter of fact, the Midrash in Sadr Eliyahu Rabbah uh, informs us that Koresh, this Gentile Persian king, he wept. And he moaned over the destruction of the holy Bet HaMikdash when it was originally conquered by Babel. He didn't think that anybody should have invaded Yerushalayim or, God forbid, destroy God's holy temple. And because he sat there and cried and moaned over the loss of Hashem's Bet Mikdash and of the holy city of Yerushalayim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose him as his instrument to fulfill the ancient prophecy and to bring the glory of the Shekhinah HaKadosha, of the divine presence, back to Haramoria, back to the holy mountain, to Yerushalayim, back to the place where Avraham bound Yitzchak. Back to the place where Yaakov dreamt about the heavenly ladder. Back to the location where David HaMelech Alav HaShalom set his hopes upon and where his son Shlomo HaMelech built the first Bet Mikdash. Koresh, the righteous Gentile monarch from Persia, gave the order that the Jews should be freed from the Galut and return to Yerushalayim so that they could rebuild the Kadosh Baruch Hu's Bet Mikdash. There were millions of Jews at that time who were spread out throughout the Persian and Babylonian Empire. I ask you, how many of them do you think made their way back to Eretz Yisrael to rebuild the second Bet Mignash? From the millions in the Galut, how many left the Galut when given the opportunity and the schut and the merit? How many? from the millions. Would you believe that it's recorded that only 42,000 people
people heeded the call. 42,000 people only understood that the prophecy of Yeshaya Hanavi was coming to pass and they responded to it accordingly. But millions stayed behind using every possible excuse. People hesitated and they asked, what does God really want from us? How do we know that this is really what Hashem wants? Where and how will we do His will? You know, we're already so accustomed to our life here. Who knows what's waiting for us in Eretz Yisrael? We haven't lived there in years. Sound familiar? That was the backdrop of the world before the actors in the Purim story entered the stage of history. And sadly, nothing has changed since then. There are still millions of Jews in the Galut that haven't responded to all the clear messages that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has been mercifully sending them. And they remain in the Galut, not only using many justifications, which by the way, Rav Chaim Kanievsky himself once commented to someone that all these justifications are not justifications. But not only are they doing that, they're planting their roots even more into the soil of a place that's now being, it's already beyond Zdom Vamora, a place that's full of Tuma. People are remodeling their homes, starting new businesses as we speak. What? If you believe the Geula is imminent, if you believe Mashiach is coming soon, because of everything that's happening in the world and the direction it seems to be going in, why in, heaven, why in heaven's name would you renovate your home and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on renovations if you're soon going to be prompted to leave that place and come to Eretz Yisrael? Why in the world would you open up a business there if you claim that very soon Mashiach is coming and you'll have to live here? You know why? Because deep down in a very hidden part of yourself that it's hard for you to admit, you don't really want to leave the Galut. You actually hope you could stay there. You probably hope that Hashem should uproot your house and bring it here, right? And uproot your business over here and bring it here, right? Hashem knows the heart of man. He's the only one who knows your truth. And it makes him sad. So I urge you to be wise and to heed the call of Hashem and to make your way back to Eretz Yisrael, which is where every Jew belongs. It's your home. It's the home that you can possess and be here with us and give us the strength that we need on so many levels, spiritually, physically, financially. You can help us in so many ways. Come back, be with us, stay with us. You'll also have the schut of seeing the redemption with your own eyes here in Eretz Yisrael. But let's go back for a moment to the war of Gog and Magog and, and clarify a few things. The Navi Yechezkel Alav Shalom states the following. And it will come to pass on that day. When Gog will come against the land of Israel, says God, God is saying, when he's going to approach Eretz Yisrael, my blazing indignation will flame in my nostrils. On that day, there will be such a great noise, such an outcry in the land. Israel. Rashi Kadosh Alav Shalom says that we are all going to feel the trepidation in the air, not only because of Gog and his advancing armies, but because of God's presence and his attribute of justice. And that great noise that the Navi talks about is going to manifest as thunderous sounds in the heavens. Then, Yechazkel Navi says, V'ra'ashu mipanai dege hayam ve'of ha'shamayim. 
and at my presence, meaning the presence of Hashem, even the fish in the sea and the birds in the heavens, and all the beasts of the field and all the creepy crawling things that creep upon the earth, and all the men who are upon the surface of the earth, they are going to shudder. They will shake and quake. And all the mountains shall be thrown down. And the cliffs shall fall to the ground. And I will call the sword against him, meaning against Gog, upon all my mountains, says God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. He's going to make them fight against each other. And I will judge against him with pestilence and with blood. And rain that brings floods. And great hailstones, fire and brimstone will I rain upon him. Gog and his advancing armies. And also, by the way, I will do this upon his hordes and upon any nations that are with him. And I will reveal myself in my greatness and in my holiness. And I will be recognized and seen in the eyes of many nations. And they will know that I am God. Just listening to the words of the Navi Cheskel makes one tremble. But we are being assured that all of the shuddering and all the trepidation and the destruction will be for the final end of the wicked Gentiles. And yes, even the wicked among the Jewish nation. And Hashem will also do this for our ultimate salvation. Now, in truth, as I stated much earlier, we don't know who Gog or Magog are. Sa'am so Rabbanim explained that it could very well be a, a group, like a coalition of a few different countries, perhaps you know a few countries from one side that come together to do battle with a few countries from the other side, and so on. According to that interpretation, the world is going to divide into two camps, which is how it appears now. The world is going to be split between the evil regimes and the cohort of the left, meaning the powers of impurity, and on the right, the righteous nations, the political regimes in the world that still have a semblance of morality left in them, still a shemitz of some good that resides in them. They will be on the right side, the side of light and of godliness and of virtue. Now, when we read the Psukim in Sefer Yechazkel, we see that Gog, together with his allies, will come to Eretz Yisrael when God's wrath will be at its peak. First of all, as a result of the indignation, but also because of all that, that's it, the morality in the world that has reached its peak, as well as the lack of godliness and because of hatred among brothers. God's wrath is going to manifest as we, as I just read to you, through winds, through storms, through rains, through hailstorms, through floods, fire, brimstone, earthquakes that are going to make mountains and cliffs collapse. There will also be a tremor so big in the land of Israel that the noise alone, Hezekiah Navi says, is going to frighten all the animals from the fish in the sea, to the beasts of the field, to the smallest crawling insects. This tremor may even trigger gigantic waves that are gonna sweep the shorelines of cities and flood 
various towns. And even the birds who fly up above that wouldn't normally be affected by an earth earthquake down below will feel the gusts of wind that no man has ever felt or seen before. Every part of the creation, from the inanimate to the highest creation called man, will tremble in fear and will be impacted by these days that are coming and have been prophesied. Mountains will crumble and the walls around us will fall to pieces. Another opinion of the Rabbanim is that many nations will gather together and it seems that at first Ishmael will do battle against Esav, against the kingdom of Edom, which is America and parts of Europe. These two great nations, Ishmael and Esav will do battle against each other. And tragically, many will die in that war that will take place only within a matter of minutes, which means that it will be nuclear. But then at some point, Esav and Ishmael will decide to call a truce, to make a temporary peace agreement, and they'll place their eyes on Israel, who they're going to blame for all the conflict in the world. So there's Esav, the kingdom of Edom, which is comprised of most of Europe and all of North America, which is the United States and maybe even parts of Canada. And there's Ishmael that will include parts of the Middle East under the Islamic regime, perhaps even uh, Russia and China will join. And of course, the main player, which is Melech Paras, Iran. The Islamic regime will do battle against the Christian world. Ishmael against Esav. There will be a grand scale holy war. Each will fight the other in the most terrible of ways in order to remain in power as the supreme religion in the world. There will be bombing and terrorist acts. Many horrific events will transpire in this war According to the Nevi'im, between Asav and Ishmael, millions of people will die in this dreadful war. We pray that it shouldn't be that way. And as a result of all the casualties on both sides of Asav and Ishmael, they're going to blame Israel for everything. And they'll create a temporary peace agreement between them. And then together, they'll march upon Yerushalayim like 70 wolves against one lone sheep, against the holy nation of Israel. And because of their evil, because they'll come with no mercy against the Jewish people, God will judge them for all the terrible wrongdoings, not only of the current generation, Chachamim tell us, but for all the spilled blood of the previous generations, hundreds of years for all the tortures and executions in the name of their false religions and prophets for their corruption and the evil that they brought to the world they're going to be judged for the falsehood and immorality that they spread and the attempts at eradicating god from the canvas of history and as the navi states hailstorms fires earthquakes you name it and brimstone will come down from the heavens to crush these evil people, the enemies of Israel. And sadly, this will include even the en enemies among our own people. The Nevi'im tell us that the sun will become dark. We will not be able to see the sun. The moon will appear red like the blood moon. This was all prophesied, by the way, in Sefer Malachi, which states, Gor Pergimen, that this will all take place. Lifne bo yom Hashem agadol ve'anora, before the coming of the great and awesome day of God. Many natural disasters, some of which the world has never seen, are going to occur. And in the midst of this chaos, God will send Eliyahu Hanavi Zachur Latov to do what? Veheshiv Lev Avot Albanim 
that he may turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the heart of the children back to their fathers. Children and parents will try to inspire one another to do tshuva, to repent. And then the Navi says, Pen avo vehiketi et ha'aretz cherem, lest I come and smite the earth under destruction. Which means God will offer us another chance to repent before that great day of judgment that will leave very few standing. Let's move on to another very interesting passage from the Zohar Kadosh that I heard being told over from a very big rabbi here called Arav Yisrael Abergel Shalita. He should live and be well. In his shiur, he didn't mince any words or try to spare the hearts of the people because he felt that we have a right to know the truth concerning the prophecies that were written and that although the, the truth may be frightening, Hashem wished for those prophecies to be recorded for future generations in order to offer us a chance to do tshuva, to repent, to rectify, in order for us to undo some of the ways in which we've been serving Hashem and to respond to the times in the way that God wishes us to. So Arav Abergel was quoting a very interesting passage in the Zohar Kadosh which actually opens up a window and offers us a glimpse of what we're about to face and how we could be saved from the prophecies of the end of days and the impending war of Gog or Magog. According to Rav Yisrael Abergel, the Zohar Kadosh describes a very deep conversation that took place between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Alav Shalom, the author of the Zohar Kadosh, and Eliyahu Hanavi Zachur Latov. And they were discussing the final exile, the final galut of Edom, which is the exile that we are currently in right now, and the exile that we've been in for the last 2,000 years since the destruction of the second Beta Migdash by the hands of the Romans. In the beginning of this passage, says Arav Abergel, the Zohar Kadosh is describing the tumult that occurred in the heavenly realms at the onset of Galut Edom, the final exile of Edom during the era of the Roman Empire. And then the Zohar Kadosh moves on to discuss the end of this Galut, which is the period, like we said, that we're currently in. So I am going to translate the words of the Zohar Kadosh into English as they were read to us by Rav Yisrael Abergel. So it's actually a third translation because first, actually a second translation is more like it. First, he was reading it to us in the uh, Aramaic language. Then he translated those words into Hebrew and I'm translating his Hebrew into English. But this is what it states in the Zohar Kadosh. Abi Shimon Bar Yochai cried out and said to Eliyahu Hanavi, Oi, I feel such despair at the fact that this galut, this exile has lingered for so long. Who can tolerate it? Eliyahu Hanavi responded to Rabbi Shimon saying, Ah, Rabbi, ah, Rabbi. If only you'd know what a stir and what an uproar God created in the upper worlds when the second Bet HaMikdash was in the midst of being destroyed. God eulogized his beloved city of Yerushalayim and said, Banai, Banai, my children, my children, my beloved ones, I raised you and elevated you as a father uplifts his son. I taught you how to fear me, and I caused you to supersede all the nations of the world. We see in these words how Hashem is clearly despondent over the exile, over having to banish Am Yisrael from Eretz Yisrael, and that he felt that he had to do it. He had to destroy his Bet Migdash due to the sins of the people. So, so let's analyze what Abishimon Bar Yochai documents 
that will take place at the end of Galut Edom. Because Rabbi Shimon writes as follows. Now that we've arrived at the end of days, meaning it tells Aliyah Navi, meaning after our discussion concerning the Galut and its lengthy period, we've arrived at the topic of what will occur in the end of days. And Rabbi Shimon tells us that in the sixth millennium, we are now in the sixth millennium, and he, by the way, uh, I'm not going to do it now, but he enters into an entire calculation of the exact date, which is not for this class. And he says, at that time, a bitter weeping voice will awaken, a voice that wasn't heard from the beginning of the world's creation. That voice will be a resounding voice of bitterness and sadness, a sound that will ascend and descend, ascend and descend. By the way, that sounds very much like the sirens that we hear in Eretz Yisrael, right? Whenever a missile is making its way in our direction from the enemy lines, what do we hear? A sound that ascends and descends, ascends, right? Ooh. Ooh. Very interesting. Abishimon says that in that moment, great troubles will awaken that will not allow a person to prepare even one hour in advance. Interestingly, from the time that this last conflict on October 7th occurred, no one's planning anything. Every day is touch and go. There, there, there's not one person who can create a daily schedule without realizing that there's a strong possibility that the schedule will change from one moment to the next, depending on the gravity of the situation. In actuality, the whole world is holding at this point. No one knows what tomorrow will bring or what's going to develop from one moment to the next. And then the Zohar Kadosh says, there will be three kings, three leaders that will arise from three different parts of the world who will come forward in battle against the nation of Israel. Now, if we look at today's political field, we could assume that the three major figures would be Putin, who's already pledged his allegiance to the Arab nations. Then there's Iran, the Persian Empire and its leader. And the Zohar Kadosh says that the third one will be the hypocrite, the one who pretends to be our friend, but plots behind our backs. And we could assume that this is referring to Joe Biden, maybe from the kingdom of Edom, which is the United States. Abishi Bar Yochai states that these three leaders from the three parts of the globe will rise against Israel. But the one who will display the most anger against our nation will be the hypocrite, the faker and the fraud from the kingdom of Edom. He will rear his ugly head with a za'am, says Abishi with a great wrath. And he will be involved in the attack against the holy nation of Israel. That means that he'll suddenly turn his back to Israel. And instead of assisting us, he will join forces with our enemies. And then what? What's going to happen to the Jewish people in Eretz Israel? So first of all, I want to tell you only good will come from this in the end. Like we said in the beginning, it's, it's all this is being done for the final end that will be good. But anyhow, the Zohar Kadosh proceeds to inform us that in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the fourth day of Sivan, which is coming up very soon, in the ninth and a half hour of the day, which is around 2.30, 3.30 p.m., something like that, between those hours, apparently, says the Zohar Kadosh, many souls from the yeshiva shel ma'ala, from the heavenly house of study, will together with the shechina hakadosha, together with the divine presence, make their way to the grave site of the ro'e ha'ne'eman, of the faithful shepherd. Who's known as the faithful shepherd of Hashem? Moshe Rabbeinu. At the great gravesite of Moshe Rabbeinu, three great cries will be resounded over his grave. When? 
says the Zohar Kadosh, in the hour that the sun will gather itself, which means with the sunset of the fourth of Sivan. And by the way, this is something we're not going to see with our eyes. This is all spiritual in the spiritual realm. But And then the Zohar Kadosh tells us that at that point, the sun will turn away from the world, meaning it's going to start setting, and the grave of Moshe Rabbeinu will open. We don't know what that means, but it sounds quite dramatic and quite serious. These are events that are going to transpire in the spiritual realm, obviously, and they're meant to assist the Jewish people in this difficult time. And that, by the way, it has to make us feel a great sense of relief and comfort and quite hopeful that we have the entire heavenly body, including the Shekhinah HaKadoshah, coming down from there, praying on our, on our behalf at the gravesite of the faithful shepherd of Moshe, who originally took us out of Egypt. Wow. Then the Zohar Kadosh continues. On the day of the holiday of Shavuot, the day that the Holy Torah was given on Har Sinai, which is coming up very soon, the Shekhinah HaKadosha, the Divine Presence, will once again leave its Holy Presence on the mountain, the mountain of Sinai. And three sounds will resonate from there. We're not clear as to whether or not we're going to hear them, but the Zohar Kadosh tells us that one voice will resound in honor of Avraham Avinu Alav Shalom. The second sound will be before Yitzhak Avinu Alav Shalom. And the third sound will resonate to represent Yaakov Avinu Alav Shalom. And then the Zohar Kadosh tells us that as a result of that great call, that great sound, so I guess uh, it is a sound that will, will, will actually resonate. It says a number of evildoers in the Holy Land, or in general on earth, will die and perish from this world because of the strength of this call, of this voice, this sound that will resonate and will be great, quite great and quite frightful. That's why we have to already from now, my dear friends and my dear students, we have to prepare ourselves to withstand and survive this time period. And we have to do so by strengthening and fortifying our emuna, our faith, and also our kedusha, our holiness. We have to be willing to sacrifice for the sake of kedusha and emuna. And I would venture to say that emuna is definitely the main item that we all have to uh, amplify and strengthen during this time now. Anyhow, the Zohar Kadosh continues. It says Rabbi Shimon, on that day, all the prayers of Am Yisrael, no matter where they may be in the world, will ascend before the Holy King HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And in one moment, all the prayers that were recited from all the previous generation will in one instance rise before Hashem. All the tears and all the troubles, all the difficulties and all the challenges throughout the generations, all the prayers of the pain and suffering we endured, but also all the joyous prayers all the tefillot of gratitude and the faithful prayers to Hashem, they will all ascend before God's throne of glory. And it's then that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will cleanse the city of Yerushalayim of all those living there who have defiled its holiness and waged war against his temple and his people. And then four mountains, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, one on top of the other will be brought to the great and holy city. Har Karmen, Har Tavor, on top of that, Har Sinai, and on top of Har Sinai will be Har Moya. And the Zohar Kadosh, by the way, tells us it's all going to happen in one day. Meaning, whatever I described to you now. And, and it's something that many of us feel will happen very soon. 
not in 100 years from now, not in 10 years from now, not in five years from now. The Geula is imminent. The retribution is looming. And the Mashiach will soon be revealed. And then, my dear friends and students, we're told something so beautiful. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes that on that day, the 10 lost tribes will be given permission to leave their borders that they were kept hidden behind all this time. What does that mean? As we know, the 10 tribes were taken into captivity during the period of the exiles. And according to many Rabbanim, they haven't yet returned to us. It's a big machloket, but most agree that today, the tribes that we do know are in our midst are the tribes of Yehuda, the tribe of Benjamin, and a small number of Leviim. But fascinatingly, we're taught that the tr 10 tribes who were lost to us actually remained fortified in their faith, loyal to Torah, and they retained the holiness as in the days of old. Imagine that. They're still like living in their minds like ancient times in terms of their holiness. According to many sources, they're all living together in some remote part of the world that we can't reach because God made it that way. Some Rabbanim have said that they live secretly and hidden behind the mountains of Tibet, beyond the river Sambation. Nobody can get there, by the way. Uh, many have tried, many have failed. So Rabbi Shimon tells us that their borders will open and they will be allowed to cross that river Sambation, cross those mountains and join us here in Eretz Israel. And why will Hashem allow them at that point to be released from across the globe and to join us? Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in order to help us prepare and strategize for an impending world war that will affect us all and take place in all four corners of the world. Rabbi Shimon says they will unite these 10 tribes together with the Mashiach who will be anointed as an earthly king over the people. And the Mashiach will accept his kingship of his kingship at the hands, says Rabbi Shimon, of the Kohen Tzedek, the righteous, upstanding, and honorable Kohen. Who is that? Eliyahu Hanavi Zechulatov. He will anoint the Mashiach. Not only that, but we're told how beautiful it is that the seven loyal and faithful shepherds will accompany him. Who are the seven faithful shepherds? Avraham Avinu, Yitzhak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, Moshe Rabbenu, Aharon HaKohen, Yosef HaTzadik, Alav HaShalom, and David HaMelech. I want you to try and imagine that scene because you should feel this electric surge of positive spiritual feelings that should inspire you with even more faith. Just imagining the 10 tribes coming back, imagining the Kohen Tzedek Eliyahu Navi Zechulatov anointing the Mashiach. Imagine the seven faithful shepherds, including Yosef HaTzadik, David HaMelech, they're all there. Try to imagine that. Rabbi Shimon continues. He says, and then, since the Holy Forefathers will know that Hashem is ready to bring forth the Geula, meaning that the redemption is about to unfold for his holy nation of Israel, there will be such a grand and joyous celebration on that day. You could cry from this passage because what we see is that regardless of all the challenges that we're going to have to face, Hashem is simultaneously planning our redemption. How inspiring is this? Many of us sense 
that based on everything that's taking place in the world and how things are playing out and developing, we, we, we could say that all the rivers are pretty much leading to the ocean, so to speak, Me which means there are so many different world events occurring all over the world that are leading up to this climactic end of this galut and a new beginning called geula, called redemption, is dawning. And we have to prepare for this moment with everything that we possess inside of us. Don't be afraid. Be prepared. Don't feel anxious. Rather, gird yourselves with the tools and actions necessary to survive the moment and to partake of this glorious redemption. But I must stress, and we can't leave this out, that Abishimon states that anything that opposes God's truth or anyone who disputed and contested God's existence or fought against his statutes will unfortunately and sadly be uprooted from this world. There will be nothing and no one left in the world that stands in opposition to Hashem, and that includes Jews here in Eretz Israel and abroad who chose the wrong side and betrayed our people because of their political beliefs and leftist ideologies. In other words, the entire world is going to be cleansed of all its evil. And then the Zohar Kadosh reveals to us that there are three wars that the nation of Ishmael will wage against the Mashiach. Would you believe that they're going to dare to do battle against the Mashiach? And, 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 and they do so because the seed of Ishmael is brazen. Ishmael is arrogant. But Abishimon states very clearly that eventually Ishmael will be completely defeated and crushed. According to the calculations made by Rabbi Shimon and that were interpreted by Rabbi Salah Berjal, who was giving the Shi'u, we're very close to the end. We're very, very close to this time period. Very close. And then the Zohar Kadosh tells us that after Sukkot, which we're talking about the Sukkot, we hope the Sukkot of this coming year, right? And more specifically, after Sukkot in the month of Cheshvan, Abi Shimon Bar Yochai states, and I quote his words, Yiplu Sonei Israel, the enemies of the Jewish people will fall. And then says the Zohar Kadosh, following all the miracles that Hashem will do for Am Yisrael during this intense time, whosoever is left amid the Jewish people around the globe following the war of Gog and Magog, meaning the remaining Jews who actually survive it, will finally make their way to Eretz Yisrael. And we pray that this should be soon, and even before this horrendous war erupts. And we encourage every Jew out there to please come. Please, please come. We love you. We care for you. We daven for you every day. We want you here with us. We want you to be here with us. It's time to leave already. What's left for you there in the Galut? As I told you, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, any, any excuse you would give, you wouldn't, wouldn't, once he told the rabbi, every excuse he gave went like this with his hand. <laughs> you know, not an excuse, not an excuse, not an excuse. I, I, I'm not judging you, but I'm imploring you. Don't make the same mistakes our ancestors made years ago, whether it was uh, the Jews of Ashkenaz in Germany and parts of that area, or the Jews in Spain, the Sephardi Jews. So we have to be careful now, my dear friends. We have to do our very best to strive towards repentance, towards Torah and the observance of mitzvot. We have to engage in as many righteous deeds as possible because Abishimon Bar Yochai informs us that the day will come 
when a shofar gadol, when the sound of the great heavenly shofar will echo and be heard throughout the world. And we will know at that moment that it's too late to repent and that the gates of repentance have now been closed. For all those who did their best to heed Hashem's call, to listen to the messages that He sent these, even just these, these past few years. For those who hearken to the heavenly voice of mercy and reason and who will do as Hashem wishes and not what they want. For those who saw the heavenly signs through political upheaval, through pandemics, wars, government betrayals, religious corruption and the like. And they responded to those signs by repenting, by trying to create unity among our brothers, by observing the mitzvot with happiness. And they, were in, and they, and, and they, and they also inspired others to do the same. For those who learned Torah with a genuine feeling of love for God's Torah and they promoted the Torah to others so that they too should bask in its light. For those who engaged in true acts of kindness and assisted others in need. And for those who made their way to Eretz Yisrael before the coming of Mashiach in order to demonstrate their faith in the redemption at the expense of their profitable and comfortable existence in the Galut. All these will have the opportunity to witness the redemption and to partake in it berachamim, with great mercy. You should say Amen. Many of you are blessed with an abundance of merits especially because of all your generous and loving acts that are so pleasing to the Creator and they're making Him so proud of you. At the same time, we have to increase our efforts all the more. Don't leave any spiritual rock unturned or any holy page unread. Turn to the Torah, turn to our lectures to learn as much as you can about how you can help yourselves and others in this pressing and volatile time in the world. A time that will precede the era of Mashiach and usher in a new dawn of redemption. You know, many of us were taught when we were in school about how wonderful the world is going to be when Mashiach comes, but we were never told about all the tragic events that are going to unfold if we don't do tshuva, if we don't genuinely repent, if we don't cling to the Torah and to the will of Hashem and do what is right and just in His eyes. Sadly, there are many of us out there who conveniently ignore all the tragic prophecies of our holy Nevi'im, claiming that the prophecies of doom and gloom don't have to come to pass. Well, they are coming to pass. And while that is indeed correct, it's only true when Am Yisrael is in good standing with Hashem. That's only true when we're at peace with one another, when we're observing the mitzvot properly, when we're creating Kiddushe Hashem in the world, and when we're learning His Torah and observing its mitzvot, not the opposite. But anyway, don't we see that the prophecies are coming true? Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, that thousands of people in Eretz Yisrael and in other parts of the world took so many mitzvot upon themselves following this brutal attack on October 7th. So many of us increased our spiritual efforts. Many people began to observe the Shabbat. Many even repented completely. Uh, soldiers began to wear tefillin and tzitzit and they prayed as they never had before. They took things upon themselves. Mothers of soldiers accepted sniyut, modesty, and Shabbat upon themselves for the safe return of their sons and for the sake of Am Yisrael. Thousands of us were involved in so much good, so much chesed. Countless Gentiles and Noahides from around the globe came through for us and responded to this tragedy of October 7th with love, with generous donations, with their allegiance to God and to the holy nation of Israel. And you will all be rewarded for your kindness and righteous acts. But now we all 
all of us, all of us have to up the ante. How? We have to increase our spiritual, spiritual efforts for the sake of Hashem and only for his sake. And not just because we want to be protected and saved, but for him, because we love Hashem. We must do more because we believe that this is what God wants and that's what he commanded. We have to engage in good deeds and in mitzvot because we love Hashem, not because we fear the great day of judgment. We should try and make peace with one another because we sincerely regret our actions towards one another and not because we want God's forgiveness and a better and happier life, which means our approach has to be one of truth and sincerity. We should draw near to Hashem because we, we have faith in Him and only Him. That's why we should be close to Him and because we love Him. You know why that's so important? Every day in the Tefillah Ba'avat Olam, right before we recite the Kriyat Shema, we recite the most beautiful and expressive words concerning God's love for us and our immense gratitude to Him for that love that He feels for us. By the way, it's worth it for you to go through this tefillah whenever you have time. But what's poignant about this prayer is that it ends with the words, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you, God. Habocher be'amo Yisrael, who chooses his nation Israel, be'ahava, with love. God is habocher, he chooses, meaning in the present tense. Every day, again and again, God chooses his nation, Israel, above all other nations, and he does so with ahava, with love. So don't you think it's time to return that love to him? Don't you think it's time for him to feel all the love that we have for him? In Sefer Devarim, the Pasuk states, Banim atem la Hashem elokechem. You are children to your God. Ki am kadosh ata la Hashem elokecha. For you are a holy nation to your God. Uvecha bachar Hashem. And it's you that God chose. Liyot lo le'am sgula. To be for him a treasured nation. Mikol ha'amim. From all the nations of the world. Asher al pnei ha'adama. That are upon the face of the earth. Did you hear these words? This is how special Am Yisrael are to Hashem. What a valued position Am Yisrael is in this world and in the eyes of Hashem. Hashem openly states in the Torah, you are children of Hashem, your God, and I have chosen you to be my treasured nation. Any parent understands what that means. A parent naturally loves his child, and he'd do anything, anything to see that child happily succeeding. We can't even imagine how great and perfect God's love for us is. But the opposite is also true because there's a saying that reads, parents are only as happy as their unhappiest child. How sad is this? But that's how much we matter to Hashem. We were given the ability and privilege to enjoy Hashem's love and to savor in His light all day. His love can make us happy without end if we allow it to make us happy. But sadly, many people also feel that God's love is a burden. And some even feel uncomfortable about it. That's indeed the state that many of us are in today. But we have to be so proud of our relationship with Hashem and, and so good about it and never to feel badly about it. We shouldn't approach our relationship to God from a place of insecurity, a place of doubt and hesitation. There's a story of a man who was uh, leaving a shul in Brooklyn and he saw a non-Jewish fellow, a young guy with a black hoodie pulled over his head and he also noticed that this young guy was wearing extra baggy pants that hung uh, way below his waistline and it showed parts of his body that really should be hidden. And that bo bothered the Jewish man. He felt that this young man's appearance wasn't befitting the dignity of a human being. And he felt he needed to address it somehow. 
So believe it or not, he went over to this young man and he said to him, uh, excuse me, do you realize your pants are hanging way down? The young guy looked at him with this blank stare and he says, yeah, so? Jewish man saw he had nobody to talk to. He walked away a little disappointed. And he's thinking to himself, I wonder if I made my point clear. Maybe I, I wasn't clear enough. So he turned back around, went up to that young man, man again. And this time he said, young man, I want you to know that you're a prince. You are such an important person. You're a prince. You just don't know how important you are. And after he said these words, he walked away. But then his curiosity got the better of him. So this man, this Jewish man turned around to look back and he saw that amazingly, the young man had pulled up his pants. That's the power of knowing that you're better than what you've become. There is a great light that shines in each and every one of us because we are the children of Hashem. We cannot be afraid of being a princely nation. Sadly, there are many times that it's our light, not our darkness, that frightens us most. We have a hard time stepping into that great light that we possess and serving the world as the treasured nation of Hashem. Instead of diminishing that light from within, we should project it outward and illuminate the path for others. We should shine with the glory of being God's children. That's one of the ways in which we could love God in return, by being proud to be his children and to behave like his children. Remember that as we proceed with these days of Nisan, as we approach the redemption and all the darkness that's going to precede it, unfortunately. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this upcoming world war that will change the landscape of the world and of history was prophesized by the holy Navi Yechazkel, Alava Shalom, where the Navi Yechazkel describes a climactic battle as we said, that will be instigated by Gog and or Magog and will be waged against Eretz Yisrael and even against God himself. And although we're uncertain as to the identity of Gog and Magog, and we don't know if Gog and Magog are the names of nations or individuals, but according to many Talmudic sources and Midrashim, there's no doubt that the main players are going to be Paras, the kingdom of Persia, which is Iran, the kingdom of Edom, which is America and parts of Europe, and Amalek, who are spread out throughout the world today um, and are also rooted in many Arab uh, countries, which is the nation of Ishmael. Now, as we know, the kingdom of Edom belongs to Asav and his descendants. But as Sav entered into an alliance with Ishmael, his uncle, and in order to solidify the agreement, he married one of his daughters. So as Sav, who is actually the grandfather of Amalek, as Sav, who eventually evolved into the kingdom of Edom, which is also Machut Romi, as Sav and Ishmael are now fused as one. This is a very dangerous and volatile combination. Now, according to Jewish tradition, the main figure in this world war is going to be Mashiach ben Yosef, the one who God anoints, who will be from the tribe of Yosef. The Midrashim state that there are going to be two redeemers, and each one will be referred to as Mashiach, the anointed one. Both are going to be involved in the ushering in of the messianic era. It's going to be Mashiach ben Yosef from the tribe of Yosef and Mashiach ben David, who descends from the Davidic dynasty, specifically from the tribe of Yehuda. Now, in Jewish teachings, Mashiach ben Yosef is sadly killed in the war against Gog Umagog. But please remember 
that it's 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 really very unclear whether his death is going to be a little literal one because of the physical battle or if, if his death is going to be due to the spiritual battles that he's going to wage against the Kohotatuma, against the forces of evil, of evil. We don't know, but either way, Zechariah Hanavi Alav Shalom describes the national mourning that will follow his death. Let me read to you the words of the Navi, and then I'll tell you what Tashia Kadosh says. The Navi states, Veshafachti Al Bet David Al Yoshev Yerushalayim, and I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, Ruach Chen Vetachanunim, a spirit of grace and supplications. Vehibitu Elayet Asher Dakru, Vehibitu Elayet Asher Dakru, and they shall look to me because of those who have been thrust with the sword. The, to, to the one who was thrust with the sword is more correctly, which is referring to the death of Mashiach ben Yosef. And then they shall mourn over him as one mourns over an only son. And they shall be in bitterness as one is embittered over a firstborn son. Ashia Kadosh states concerning the words of his Savdu Alav, and they shall, they shall mourn over him the following words. What are we going to mourn about? Al Oto Hereg. We're going to mourn over that specific slaughter. And then Rashi says, when it states in the Pasuk, Kem misped al hayachid, that we're going to mourn over him as one mourns over an only son, Rashi Kadosh says, Verabotenu darshuhu al Mashiach ben Yosef sheneherag be Masechet Suka. And our sages have expounded in the Gemara of Suka that this is actually re referring to Mashiach ben Yosef who's going to be slain. Lo alenu, it shouldn't happen. The good news is that the death of Mashiach ben Yosef is not unavoidable because the Holy Arizal, the Holy Ariya Kadosh, Alava Shalom Rabbi Yitzchak Luria wrote that when we recite the following words in the tefillah of Amida, the silent prayer, when we say, David tachin, may you speedily establish the throne of your servant David. Those words we have to concentrate, we have to beseech Hashem that Mashiach ben Yosef should not be harmed in the course of his struggles. As a matter of fact, in some Sidurim and some prayer books, it actually states in parentheses, you should have in mind to pray Al Mashiach ben Yosef, on behalf of Mashiach ben Yosef. And it says, that he should live and not perish at the hands of Armilus the wicked. We don't know who Armilus is, but we should pray for the safety of Mashiach ben Yosef. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin asks, what's going to happen when Mashiach reveals himself? Chachamim tell us that Mashiach is tasked with pretty much saving the world from the brink of spiritual annihilation and doing his, his very best to cause all those who have gone astray to repent. Sadly, all those who, who refuse to veer away from their evil ways or their idolatrous practices. All those who will not repent or who will choose to remain in the galut because they didn't really yearn properly for the geula will not manage to survive, unfortunately. No, Aleno. Shouldn't happen. And certainly, by the way, when describing the war of Gog and Magog, uh, it's not so simple. Zechariah Navi, Alav Shalom's vivid description depicts a nuclear and radial catastrophe that can wipe out millions in a matter of seconds. He also goes into great detail concerning the extensive damages that, that, that are going to be caused to a person's body because of the effects of the war. So the Navi was literally describing the impact of an atomic bomb and the damage of the radiation. It's quite frightening, quite frightening, and it forces us to ask, how can we protect ourselves from the impending doom?
Well, we've been discussing quite a number of ways, but Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkonos, Alava Shalom, stated in the Gemara that one of the ways that we can be saved from the war of Gog and Magog is by engaging in Torah and Gwilut Hasadim. By being involved in the study of Torah, the promotion of Torah, as I mentioned earlier, as well as acts of kindness. The learning and the promoting of Torah, as well as charitable acts, will save us. The Gemara actually says an abundance of kindness, like not just regular acts of chesed, abundance of chesed. And by the way, one of the level, highest levels of kindness one of the highest levels of chesed is when you introduce and inspire someone to become closer to Hashem. That's the ultimate chesed because when a person develops a relationship with Hashem, he begins to observe his mitzvot. He leaves the material and idolatrous, idolatrous world that may have, he may have been involved in and he clings to the words of Hashem. And then what happens? That barrier that once stood between him and the truth is lifted. And he ha now has the ability to clearly see what Hashem wants for him and from him. So I want to tell you that many of you, many of you should feel good about the fact that you've been engaged not only in the learning of Torah as you're doing right now, but the spreading of Torah. How many of you have donated to Torah hours? How many of you have sponsor sponsored a lecture? You're accumulating an abundance of merits due to all your generous contributions. So many of you are donating to the mikvah, which is an act of chesed, to sponsor a bride. So many of you are giving money now for kimcha de pischa to, to help needy families. So much chesed is being done on your part. But moving on, what's clear is that in many Sfarim, it states that the beginning of Gog and Magog, the final world war, commences on Sukkot, which is a frightening thought if you think about it, because that's exactly what happened in Eretz Yisrael on October 7th, the final day of Sukkot, which took place on Shabbat, on Simchat Torah. That was actually the beginning of the end. We see that it began as an internal conflict between Israel and Yishmael, but its influences and effects have spread to the entire world. It's also clear, as I stated earlier, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will use this national and global conflict to sift the world of evil, of any Gentiles that opposed him and opposed his nation, of any wicked or fraudulent Jews. Uh, he will use it to eradicate the Erev Rav. In the case of the Erev Rav, by the way, the Midrash states that the ground is going to open up as it did in the episode of Korach, and it's literally going to swallow up all the evildoers amid the nation. I actually heard uh, recently a lecture by Rav Meir Eliyahu Shalita, a brilliant Gaon a rabbi, a young rabbi who's mamash brilliant. He says that when Mashiach comes, he was teaching us that the Erev Rav is going to oppose the Mashiach, if you could believe it, which means Jewish people will oppose the Mashiach. And then he mentioned that the Zohar Kadosh concerning Parashat Shemot states that in the end of days, yamim, the Erev Rav will join forces with the other nations of the world against the Mashiach. Could you believe this? But in the end, the words of Yeshaya Hanavi will come to pass. Vehika Eretz Beshevet Piv. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of God's lips, he's going to put the wicked to death. All those who acted upon their hatred towards the nation of Israel, including the Erev Rav, anyone who opposed Am Yisrael and opposed God, will, and, and that they don't do tshuva, that's very, very important to say, will sadly meet their end. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule, like the Hasidei Umot Olam, the righteous among the Gentiles who will be spared. And it goes without saying that the righteous among Am Yisrael, as well as the Tinnokot Shen Nishbe'u, all the lost souls who didn't even know their origins or their faith, and those who were obviously pure in the observance of mitzvot and they behaved with tahara across the board. Uh, 
as well as all those who weren't truly evil, but they were just misled. That's how they were taught. All those people will have an opportunity to be saved. But all the truly wicked people, Gentiles and Jews alike, who wanted to see the downfall of Israel, as well as the purging of the Torah, they will not have the merit to witness the redemption. If they don't do tshuva, they will perish without a chance of repentance. Sadly, there are so many rashaim, so many wicked people among the Jewish nation itself. Yeshaya Navi warned us about them when he said, those who destroy you and those who try to abolish you, shall go forth from you. Sadly, the Navi was telling us that many of the wicked people who are going to attempt to destroy us and bring our faith to an end, they sit among us. They claim to have Jewish roots, but everything they do and their entire existence is about uprooting Judaism. These are the Erev Rav among us. And the Zohar Chadash, in, uh, regarding Parashat Bereshit, actually refers to this sect of the Erev Rav, these horrible Jews, as Amalekim. Interesting. The Zohar Chadash informs us that there are five sects five sects amid the Erev Rav. One of them is called Amalekim. Who are these people? These are Jews who were born Jewish, but their soul is rooted in the nation of Amalek. And the Zohar Hadash says these Jews are worse than all the other four sects of the Erev Rav. In the Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Pinchas actually states that it's because of these Jews who get in the way of our spiritual progression and elevated status more than any other nation in the world. They're getting in the way. Their interference in our spiritual life is what's deterring us from doing tshuva and bringing the geula. But when Mashiach comes, God is going to begin the process of what we call beru. The sifting will begin so that our nation and the entire world can remain pure, clean and holy. Whoever, whoever will merit to be amid the 20% who will remain standing and worthy will witness the greatest miracles that the world has ever seen. But those who continue to oppose the geula, who refuse to heed the messages from Shamaim, and they persist in their devious schemes to come in the way of God's master plan, According to our, our, our sages and our prophets, they, they will be among the 80% who will not survive, unfortunately. My dear friends and students, in these times of uncertainty and upheaval, believe it or not, you can, you can find comfort and refuge in the words of Hashem, in His promise to us and in His love. In these end of days of Achit Yamim, we have to find a way to cling to our faith and to Hashem and to do whatever we can to remain steadfast in our bitachon in Him, in our trust in Him. We have to be vigilant in our observance of mitzvot and not waver from the path of righteousness and good deeds. Before we move on, I, I want to address a question that one of you asked me in your email, which is, what is Galut? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Galut means exile. Nearly 2,000 years ago, we were banished from our homeland, Eretz Yisrael, due to our sins. And we were sent off into a very difficult Galut that has lasted till, till this very day. And we are all waiting and we are all yearning for the day when this exile and all the suffering that accompanied it will come to an end. But the question should also be not just what is Galut, but why are we in the Galut? Because Galut is often described as a punishment for our past sins and failures. And that's true, but that's just part of the story. You see, at the Brit Ben Abetarim, at the covenant between the parts between Hashem and Avraham Avinu, it was first established that there was going to be a Jewish people. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Avraham that his descendants would one day be strangers in a foreign land. 
the Galut, the Egyptian exile, was determined by God even before there was an official nation called Am Yisrael. In the same way, it's a, it's, a, it's a common misconception to think that the messianic era is only meant as an opportunity for Hashem to reward the Jews for the 2,000 years of Galut that we endured uh, while we were serving Hashem loyally. And although this is definitely one of the reasons for the final geula, for the final redemption, it's not necessarily its ultimate objective. You see, the second pasuk in Sefer Bereshit states as follows. And the earth was astonishingly empty. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. The Midrash of Bereshit Rabbah comments on the Pasuk that the words and the Spirit of God is actually referring to Mashiach, the spirit of Ruach of Mashiach. In other words, Hashem created Or, light, and Choshech, he created darkness. He created a physical light and he created a physical darkness. But he also created their spiritual counterparts, which is Geula and Galut, redemption and exile. Obviously, redemption represents the O, the light, and exile, Galut, is represented by the darkness. And even before Hashem brought the exile into being, our rabbis tell us that he envisioned a time when the light will banish the dark. Vayehi erev, vayehi bokir. The light banishes the darkness. He envisioned the light of Mashiach dispelling the darkness. So the messianic era was actually God's main motivation in creating this world. And that era is a time where Hashem's existence and his presence in the world is very, very palpable among the human beings. That was one of Hashem's desires. He wanted to dwell, so to speak. He wanted to be sensed and acknowledged, not just in the heavens above, but on the earth below. And that's something that's going to happen when Mashiach comes. But in order for that to happen, we need to first experience galut. We need to experience the darkness. Why? It's always the vayihi erev first. You see, every one of Hashem's creations is infused with a soul with a neshama, which is our spiritual essence. But the neshama, which is our core, is hidden. We don't see our neshama, but what we do see is our material body, which conceals our essence, our neshama. And because we only see our bodies, we actually assume that the body is the supreme being of ourselves, meaning we're, we, we actually assume we're, we're independent beings. So what's our job? Our job is to unveil the mask called the body, meaning to reveal the concealment so that we could reach into our core, into our souls. And we could accomplish this every time we're utilizing materialism to serve Hashem. When we do that, we're actually revealing the ultimate purpose of that creation, no matter what that creation may be. I'll give you an example. When I use this table over here to study Torah or to teach it like I'm doing right now, when I use my candles, which are material items, to light the Shabbat candles, when I use my money in the bank account for charitable deeds, when I use my feet my feet are material, it's a body, part of my body, to walk, to do an act of kindness. All these material, physical acts serve a unique purpose, and that's to reveal the divine essence hidden within the material aspect of creation. This is one of the underlying reasons why over the course of centuries, Amisal was scattered among the four corners of the globe. You see, all those sparks of holiness 
embedded within the physical creation were dispersed throughout the world. And those sparks necessitate a Jew to be engaged in some spiritual act, no matter where he may be in the world. So we could have, let's say, a Jew make a bracha, recite a blessing over a cup of water somewhere in China, or a Jew who puts up a mezuzah somewhere in South Africa, and a Jew in Canada who immerses in a mikvah, or a Jew in America who lights the menorah on Hanukkah. That's what the geula, that's what the redemption is, is all about. It's all about illuminating the darkness to reveal the holiness that resides within creation and inside of us. But in order for the light to illuminate the darkness, we need to be in darkness. We need to be in the galut. But when Mashiach comes, our eyes are going to be opened to a very exalted world of truth. And we're going to be able to see through the darkness. And we're going to be able to understand the mystery of this galut and everything that we accomplished in it as people who remained loyal and faithful to Torah, to Hashem, and to the soul that's within us. That's why, interestingly, the Hebrew word for redemption, which is geulah, shares the same letters as another word, which actually means eg exile, which is gola. The only difference between them is the added aleph that transforms the word gola, exile, to the word geula, which means redemption. The aleph, which has a numerical value of one, represents who? represents the one creator who is indivisible. So that Aleph represents the one creator who we insert into our lives and in every part of creation. And when we do that, he becomes revealed to us. And that state of God's complete revelation is what creates a state of geula, of redemption. So in everything that we do and in every aspect of creation that we come across, we have to reveal the Aleph that's embedded within it. We have to see Hashem in it. And that's how we can bring the entire world to a redemptive state, a world where God is going to be revealed to everyone. Now, when Am Yisrael was a young nation, Hashem's presence was felt. God very frequently and very openly was involved in the happenings of this world and specifically on behalf of his chosen nation in a way that was very clear and very obvious. And his presence motivated us to want to connect to him, especially since the love that we were shown by Hashem was what energized the relationship. But then our sins caused the Shekhinah HaKadosha, the divine presence, to ascend to the heavens. And for many people, God's clear presence was no longer felt. We descended into Galut. The Aleph was removed. And we were now in a world of Hestel Panim, where God was now concealed and remained hidden. So the era of Mashiach that we are in now, is meant to help us restore our relationship with Hashem and to restore the Aleph, to put the Aleph back in. It's offering us this galut, the opportunity to earn the privilege to experience a real relationship with Hashem and to maintain that relationship even in the absence of His revealed presence. For 2,000 years now, we've been in Choshech in the galut, in a spiritual blackness that, by the way, has not deterred many of us. So many Jews literally went through fire and water to prove their loyalty to Hashem beyond the shadow of a doubt. And it's, it's, it's now time to come out of that darkness and be led into the light. We are the descendants of Avam Avinu, and we have to know it, we have to live it. We have to be proud of it. His spiritual genes of emunah is coursing through our veins. 
Avraham was the first person in the world to unmask Hashem in a society full of people who hid behind their idols, behind false ideologies. Avraham's faith in God was so great. His faith in God was so evident that it's Avraham who infused his own faith into Hashem so that God should have faith in us, in Am Yisrael. So that even when Avraham's descendants will be filled with sins, Hashem will have faith in them in the same way Avraham had faith in him. And then that faith in us will inspire us to return to Hashem, the faith that he has for us, Hashem. Avraham didn't only have a strong and complete faith in Hashem, just for himself, but he wanted to instill that faith in future generations. I will end with this thought. Chachamim tell us that Avraham he'emin, Avraham believed. But the word he'emin doesn't just mean that he believed, but also that he caused others to believe. Avraham he'emin, he instilled in others an unwavering and powerful faith in Hashem. So much so that in the worst times, in the darkest moments of Galut Mitzrayim, the Egyptian exile, his descendants never lost their faith in Hashem. The Gemara of Shabbat states very clearly that Am Yisrael are called Ma'aminim, Bnei Ma'aminim. We are believers who are the children of believers. And that's referring to a faith that was instilled within us by Avraham Avinu. And it's in this chut, it's in the merit of this kind of faith that Am Yisrael was redeemed from Egypt. My dear friends and students, the faith of our ancestors is embedded within each of us in this galut that we find ourselves in. And we could find a way out of this darkness if we shine the light of Torah, the light of mitzvot, and kiddushah from within to the outside. In this way, we'll be able to be a light unto the nations, and we will have the merit of illuminating the darkness to help others to see Hashem clearly in their life. May we be zeicher, we should merit to strengthen ourselves in our faith, to do a complete tshuva, and to merit all the miracles of the Geula that very soon we will all experience. Amen ken, Yehi Ratzon. Shema Adonai Eloheinu Adonai